The New Orleans Secular Humanist Association welcomes everyone who's interested in exploring ideas from the humanist, non-religious perspective. For me, secular humanism is a philosophy for living and learning. Secular humanists use science and reason to understand the universe and solve human problems. As a non-religious person, I cannot accept supernatural answers to life's questions. Secular humanists confine their search for the truth to the natural world. Some of my highest goals in life are expressed in human secularism. To enjoy life in the here and now, and to strive for moral excellence. We believe in striving for the best and noblest that is possible in human beings. These viewpoints reflect our philosophy, which applies to all aspects of our lives. Each of our programs will try to apply reason to various interesting topics and show how this approach differs from the dogma of non-humanist thinking. Thanks again for watching our program. I'm Harry Greenberger. I'm president of the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association and the host of this show. We uh, uh, again have a very interesting guest. I hope some of you saw a prior program with our guest, who is the Reverend Clinton Crawshaw, who is with the New Orleans Metropolitan Community Church. And let me just tell you a little bit about his background. He was born in Surrey, England in 1970, uh, attended Exeter College in St. Stephen's House, Oxford, and after a career in horticulture, was ordained into the Anglican priesthood in 2002, not that long ago. It was his need to reflect truth, especially in issues around human sexuality, uh, that led him to transfer his credentials to the Metropolitan Community Church in 2007. Uh, he's now pastor of the Big Easy MCC in New Orleans. Uh, Reverend Crenshaw has a passion for the inclusive message of Christianity and the need for the mystical experience in Christianity allied to academic theology. Well, before we talk about some topics we did not discuss last time, give us uh, just a quick description of what the Metropolitan Community Church is. Well, Metropolitan Community Churches are a, a fellowship of churches across the world um, founded in the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community but with an outreach to everyone that we do have a specific mission to give a prophetic message of inclusion to that community. Um, we are now in 22 different countries, uh, 44,000 members and we have now just opened churches in um, some of the most homophobic uh, nations on earth in Jamaica and Nigeria where our clergy are sometimes in extreme danger and certainly the people attending church are subject to some pretty extreme bigotry um, and we were founded by uh, Reverend Troy Perry who was a Church of God uh, minister who had a experience a life-changing experience where he believed that he was told that he was loved as he was he was going through a very difficult time with his sexuality um, and therefore, after receiving that message, as it were, that he was loved as God created him, um, as a gay man, uh, he felt a call to spread that pretty much as far and as wide as he could, especially after a friend of his committed suicide because of his sexuality. When you mentioned spreading it uh, far, I think you have previously told us that it seems to be more more prevalent in the United States than than in other countries. Thus far, well, yes. Uh, how, how would you account for that in light of this of the fundamentalist Christians who seem to have the loudest voices? Well, possibly because they had the loudest voices, they've also injured a great number of people, um, sometimes through malice, but often through honest ignorance. Um, the subject of human sexuality is something of such importance. Um, let me tell you, put it this way, 
if I need to know what it's like to be French, for example, yes. okay, I may read some books and find out about it. If it's vitally important to know what it's like to be French, I will go to France and live there for a little while. Now, a great many people make pronouncements on human sexuality through assumption, assuming they know the answer, uh, they've read bits of the Bible, they know what their pastor told them, they know what it's all about. And yet the words, even honestly meant, can deeply and profoundly injure people. Um, I have had congregational members who had demons exercised out of them, who have tried for years, sometimes decades, to change their sexuality. Um, and of course, from a Christian perspective, that could be viewed as blasphemy. You're effectively saying that, well, as you made me is not good enough, I'm going to accept the word of somebody else, um, and I'm going to try and change to what they want me to be, not I as I was made. I'm not aware that there's an effort to convert heterosexuals Indeed. into homosexuality. Indeed. So, no. I mean, we're talking about uh, people who have every right to live their lives as, as whomever they might be. Mm -hmm. And as you uh, have indicated previously, and, and today, uh, your church is open to uh, other than just the lesbian gay community, and you do have people attending we do. who are not necessarily in that group. Well, I'll tell you what I would like to talk about now, and I'm sure that our listeners are wondering uh, why a secular humanist group is having this discussion uh, with a pastor, but uh, we as an organization are open to, to uh, whomever wants to, to attend, and people who are part of our group choose different labels, you know, we have atheists, agnostics, we have naturalists, uh, we have um, any, whatever label they might, they might choose. Most of our people are, we're formerly religious, we have ex-Catholics and, you know, ex-Jews and whatever, but uh, what I'd like to talk about, at least start talking about, uh, is a matter that is of serious concern to our group, and that is the separation of government from religion, which was spelled out in the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, and you may be from England, but I, I'm sure you know about all of that, and uh, the First Amendment, which provided you know, for the freedom of religion, was not very specific. However, the Constitution also designated that the United States Supreme Court were the final arbiters of what was intended in the words of the Constitution. And the United States Supreme Court over 50 years ago said in effect uh, that uh, the intent of the, uh, of the writers of the Constitution was that, uh, that there should be a total separation of government from religion. And let me just uh, give you a part of the opinion that came down that was in 1947. This is a part of what was written at that time by the United States Supreme Court. And it says, the establishment of religion clause in the First Amendment means at least this. Neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church, neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. And it goes on from there. But taking that into account, our group is very concerned with the complete separation of government from religion and religion from government. And the fact is that this freedom of religion in this country has allowed the most variety and numbers of, of churches of any country in the world, mm -hmm. yours being one among... I guess thousands of yeah. denominations. So uh, it's it's just amazing to us that there are many church leaders who would like to to uh, violate that provision in the Constitution. So what in what is your personal or your church's position on church-state separation? Well, this is my personal opinion that it's a kiss of death for any church that seeks to be allied to the state. Uh, my own experience as a Church of England priest um, back in England, of course, the Queen is the uh, supreme head of the Church of England, and 